Good evening, I'm Nima Rajan and this is Forum Daily for Wednesday, May 17th. And tonight, concerns continue to grow in Canada's aviation sector. Thousands of WestJet customers are anxiously waiting to see if the airline can reach a tentative agreement with its pilots and avert a strike set to start Friday morning. The CEO of WestJet says a massive gap remains in place between the airline and its pilots' union. Alexis von Hansbrunk says negotiations continue as the clock ticks down to a strike deadline affecting some 1,800 pilots. Mr. Von Hansbrunk says the possibility of a strike has already affected bookings. A strike would also affect customers of WestJet's low-cost subsidiary Swoop. The impact of wildfires across western Canada is starting to spread further east. Environment Canada has issued a long list of special air quality statements. They stretch from central B.C. to the Manitoba-Ontario boundary. This comes as smoke from wildfires, brings poor air quality, and makes breathing difficult for some. Wildfire smoke is hazardous, even at low concentrations, and meteorologists are urging children, the elderly, and people with lung conditions to avoid strenuous outdoor activities. Fires continue to threaten the city of Fort St. John, B.C., and they have already forced thousands of people from their homes in Alberta and the Northwest Territories. Moving south to the South Pacific, where Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and South Korea's president say they both recognize that China is an important economic partner. But Mr. Trudeau says there is a need to be clear-eyed when it comes to cooperating with Beijing. He says Yoon suk yeol agreed to work together on supply chains for critical minerals and to strengthen their economy's ties to reduce their dependence on China. The visit also produced a renewed arrangement on youth mobility and an annual quota of 12,000 people. Canada is being urged to consider Africa in its long-term strategic plans. An independent senator from Quebec says Africa is set for an economic boom, and Canada should treat it with the same attention as the Indo-Pacific region. The call was made by Senator Amina Djerba. It comes as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government downgrades its long-delayed plan for Africa from a strategy to a framework. It says this better reflects the original intent of the policy. Canada's spy agency has been formally directed to investigate and disclose any and all foreign threats against parliamentarians or their families. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino has formally instructed CSIS to give such threats the highest level of attention in a new ministerial directive. MP Michael Chong recommended his fellow MPs obtain as many relevant documents and records related to his case. This is in order to better understand the systemic failure that led to him learning about the threats against his family. Green Energy in Canada is getting an investment from a South Korean company. A subsidiary of SK Group has invested $50 million U.S. in Canadian green hydro project Nugeo Honik. The deal with World Energy GH2 would see SK Ecoplant acquire a 20% stake in the first stage of the project in Newfoundland and Labrador. New Geo Honig is designed to be a green hydrogen and ammonia producer powered by renewable electricity from wind. Last year, Canada and Germany signed an agreement to build a new hydrogen supply chain across the Atlantic. All right, well, meanwhile, the dispute over the Line 5 pipeline continues. Canadian pipeline giant Enbridge has filed court documents in advance of a hearing tomorrow. It claims an indigenous ban that wants to shut down the cross-border Line 5 pipeline is overstating the risk. It says the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa is engaging in counterfactual speculation. They are stating that even under current conditions, the chances of the pipeline rupturing are minuscule. The band argues that erosion at the point where the pipeline crosses the Bad River has been so significant that it poses an imminent threat to the watershed. Canada and the U.S. are teaming up to build a corridor of charging stations between Quebec City and Michigan. This is to encourage motorists in both countries to buy more electric vehicles. Transport Minister Omar El Gabra and U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg unveiled their alternative fuel corridor at an event in Detroit. The corridor is expected to run 1,400 kilometers from Quebec City to Kalamazoo, Michigan. It would link Montreal, Toronto and Detroit along the way. The NHL is about to stage a very non-traditional pair of conference finals. 
Every game will be played in the Sun Belt for the first time, and there is not an original six franchise in sight. Carolina will take on the Florida Panthers in the Eastern Conference Final on Thursday night, and the Dallas Stars and the Golden Knights open the West Final Friday night in Las Vegas. Stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back, so don't go away. Up next, a look at the possibility of hormone therapy for women suffering from debilitating symptoms of menopause. We're going to be joined by Dr. Abhishek Rout, medical director at Apple Tree Medical Group, to unpack this. Stay with us. A Toronto doctor says more women suffering through symptoms of menopause should be offered hormonal therapy. Dr. Ileana Lega is the lead author of a new paper published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. It says women in their 40s and 50s can have debilitating day-to-day -day symptoms of hot flashes, disrupted sleep, and mood changes. Many doctors have been hesitant to prescribe hormonal therapy. This is because a study in the 90s linked it to higher breast cancer and stroke risks. But Dr. Lega says recent studies show that those risks were overstated and are mainly associated with women over 60. Well, join Joining us now to give us his take on hormonal therapy for menopausal women in our weekly medical segment is Dr. Abhishek Rout, medical director at Apple Tree Medical Group. Dr. Rout, welcome back. Great to be here. So let's talk about menopause, Dr. Rout. This is something that all women will eventually experience, but it's not usually talked about like many women's issues. So how does menopause affect a woman's body? Right. Like many women's issues, indeed. So menopause is a national uh, biological process that can uh, basically occur when the ovaries stop releasing eggs and produce lower levels of uh, the hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, typically in menopause, there's a transitional phase called perimenopause. And during this phase, uh, which can last several years, in fact, the hormonal fluctuations become much more prominent and that can lead to irregular menstrual cycles and a lot of menopausal symptoms. Uh, the average age for menopause in women is around 45 to 55 years, uh, but roughly the average age is being 51, but the timing can vary quite a bit there. And Dr. Lega says some of these symptoms of menopause are debilitating. So uh, can you go over these symptoms and how long they can persist? Right. So you can have very debilitating symptoms, severe hot flashes, which is a very common symptom. You can have night sweats as well, uh, which happen during sleep. There's vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. Uh, we also ex uh, experience mood swings and depression and sleep disturbances that we experience throughout, as well as a lot of cognitive changes. So quite a few severe symptoms that can occur. Very severe symptoms, Dr. Rao. Now, uh, what exactly is hormonal therapy and what is it used for typically? Right, so hormonal therapy is basically a treatment option uh, for managing any hormonal deficiencies, and it can be used for a diversity of conditions there, uh, and we don't just use it for menopause, but certainly in a menopausal context, it can be very helpful as well. So in what ways could hormonal therapy affect a menopausal woman's uh, symptoms? Right, it's a great question. So we have several societies, including the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada and the North American Menopause Society, who recommend uh, menopausal hormonal therapy first line to treat a lot of these symptoms uh, they, because they make a, a huge impact in, uh, in terms of symptom profile. For, in, uh, for instance, hot flashes can be reduced by around 75%. Same thing with night sweats as well. So it can make a profound difference in a woman's life to be on these medications. Now, meanwhile, there seems to be some health risks and concerns around using hormonal therapy as a treatment for menopause symptoms. Uh, can we go over the risks as well, Dr. Rout? Right. So we talked about two organizations who, who say use it as first line, but the Canadian Cancer Society recommends women should avoid taking hormone replacement therapy unless they have severe menopausal symptoms, which seems reasonable as well. Now, the risks are small, but they are present. There is an increased risk of certain cancers like breast cancer, uh, increased risk of blood clots, deep vein thromboses. Uh, and in certain cases, it can also increase the risk of stroke and heart attacks, particularly in older women. Uh, and uh, just uh, as mentioned before, these were risks that we had seen before in the 90s. And really current literature shows that those risks are much smaller than what we thought of uh, in the 90s. All right, Dr. Rao. Now, Dr. Lega mentioned that doctors need to evaluate the risks and benefits of patients in their 40s and 50s on a case-by-case -case basis. So what are some of the factors for doctors and patients to consider when uh, deliberating hormonal therapy? Right. What we do know is that with the risks we mentioned, uh, what we do as doctors is look for a history of certain cancers. So a history of breast, ovarian, or endometrial cancers, a history of blood clots or stroke or even heart disease. And we just evaluate those risks in context with the patient to see if they would be high risk for these effects. 
And how accessible is hormonal therapy for menopausal women, Dr. Rout? How can get, they get access to it? Yeah, I think this is a huge problem right now. Uh, because it's complicated, because we have to weigh the pros and cons of treatment, assess the risk, uh, many doctors are actually not too comfortable providing hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and it really is a shame because there's a lot of women who are suffering and who really benefit from having access to hormone replacement therapy for their severe symptoms. Sounds like uh, there's some work to be done in this sector. All right, Dr. Rout, always appreciate your time. Thank you for, for joining us on Forum Daily. Thanks so much. Stay with us. We've got to go to break now, but we'll be right back. After the break, we're going to take a look at the upcoming summit of the Group of Seven in Hiroshima, Japan. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will be arriving in Japan for the summit, which is set to begin this Friday. We're going to be joined by Dr. Ella Kokotsis from the G7 Research Group at the University of Toronto to discuss what Canadians can expect from this year's G7 summit. And after that, a look at the major news stories and headlines from around the world. So stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back after the break. Leaders of the Group of Seven Countries are beginning their 49th annual summit on Friday, and Japan is hosting this year. The meeting comes as the G7 warns that the international community is at a historic turning point. Talks are set to focus on seven main issues, regional affairs, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, economic resilience and security, climate and energy, food, health and development. Well, joining us now to discuss what to watch for at this year's G7 summit and what Canadians can expect from the talks is Dr. Ella Kokotsis, the Director of Accountability at the G7 Research Group at the University of Toronto. Dr. Kokotsis, welcome to Forum Day. Thanks, Seema. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. So as we mentioned, the G7 summit is draped on the background that the international community is at a historic turning point. So what in particular makes this summit stand out compared to others? Seema, I think what makes this particular G7 significant is that leaders are really confronting two critical existential threats. The first threat is that, of course, of nuclear weapons proliferation arising not only from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also Iran's drive to acquire nuclear weapons and nuclear armed North Korea, which is threatening its neighbors, and also China with its military exercises around Taiwan. And of course, the second major threat is that of climate change as global temperatures approach a critical tipping point. So the G7, I think, are going to be heavily focused on how they can accelerate their own pathways towards net zero by 2050 or preferably before then by making those significant advances that they need to make in order to advance the green energy transition. Now, as you say, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is set to be top of mind for most of, or if not all, leaders. But Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, who's going to be chairing this year's meeting, he's likely going to use the opportunity to highlight tensions in the Indo-Pacific, including moves by North Korea, as you say, growing its nuclear arsenal, and China encroaching in the Indo-Pacific. How do you see these issues being unpacked at the G7 in terms of priority? Yeah, indeed, you're absolutely right. Japan's Prime Minister Kishida will use the opportunity of hosting the G7 to rally continued support for Ukraine. But Japan is also going to be looking to the other leaders to galvanize support and recognition of its own security concerns in the Indo-Pacific region. And this is largely because Japan now faces a very different security environment than it did even a decade ago. North Korea's accumulation of ballistic missiles has put Japan at risk. And of course, Beijing's accelerated military buildup has also raised serious concerns in Tokyo as Japan's waters and airspace are routinely challenged by Chinese forces. And Japan is also watching very closely this developing China-Russia access to determine what implications it's going to have for Japan's security. So certainly that's going to be a very critical issue for Japan this year as it hosts the summit. And in terms of moves against Russia in particular, we know leaders are expected to tighten sanctions on Russia at the summit, particularly aimed at energy and exports. So what might these measures look like? Well, the G7 are likely to agree to keep reducing Russian energy imports, first off, and create mechanisms that are going to trace the export of certain Russian products, including, for example, diamonds or other minerals. The leaders, I think, are also going to try to close certain loopholes that currently exist that allow some non-G7 countries to access and then re-export those goods and technology back to Russia. Now, we've heard about a U.S. proposal to replace the existing sector-by-sector -sector sanctions with a full export ban. Um, some exemptions, though, would include agriculture and medical products, but there are some G7 countries that may oppose this approach. Um, but certainly, um, I do expect to see tightened Russian sanctions in the leader's final outcome document, absolutely. 
All right, Dr. Kakatsis, just over a minute left here, but another major goal at this meeting is outreach to the global south, especially amid China's growing influence in these nations. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and why this is a key priority and how uh, the G7 nations are likely to tackle this issue? Sure. Um, Japan's prime minister is pursuing deeper cooperation with the global south, and I think his intentions seem to be clear to convince leaders in the global south that the G7 is relevant, it is committed to the rule of law, and it can serve as a viable alternative to economic cooperation with China, particularly in areas of energy, tech, cybersecurity, innovation, and financing for these mega projects. So Japan has effectively positioned itself as this bridge, so to speak, between the G7 and, um, and the Global South. And uh, it's, it's going to continue to advocate on those policies to bring the Global South into closer cooperation relations with the G7 Summit this year. All right, Dr. Kokatsis, we've got a quick 30 seconds left here, but what are you watching from the Canadian delegation at this, me at this meeting? Well, um, I think um, the Prime Minister is certainly going to be very focused on um, uh, continued um, support for Ukraine, where Zelensky is set to address world leaders again once, uh, once again by video link, as well as economic and energy security, pathways, of course, to net zero emissions, uh, transition to a cleaner economy, and of course, respect for human rights and continued adherence to international rules and norms. We've heard the prime minister speak about this extensively on his international trips, and this G7 will be no exception in that regard. Lots to keep our eyes out for. Dr. Kokatsis, thank you for your time today. Thank you. U.S. President Joe Biden says he's confident that the country will avoid a debt default. Mr. Biden says talks with congressional Republicans have been productive, and he believes there will be an agreement on the budget. Negotiators have been scrambling to strike an agreement, which would unlock a path forward for raising the debt limit past $31.4 trillion by June 1st. Now, that's the date that the Treasury Department has said that the U.S. could begin defaulting on its obligations, potentially triggering financial chaos. Europe is bringing in a new measure to address Russia's war in Ukraine. More than 40 countries at a Council of Europe meeting in Iceland have backed a system to estimate the damage Russia is causing during the war in Ukraine. Now, this is in the hopes that Moscow can be forced to compensate victims and to help rebuild the country once the conflict is over. Well, and some good news for global food security. Russia has reportedly agreed to extend the Black Sea Grain Initiative by another two months. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan made the announcement today. The deal was brokered last summer by Turkey and the United Nations. It allows for Ukraine to ship grain through the Black Sea to parts of the world struggling with hunger. Russia had set a Thursday deadline for its concerns to be ironed out or had threatened to bow out. Disaster in Italy, where at least eight people are confirmed to have been killed in flooding in the northern part of the country. The flooding forced Formula One to cancel this weekend's Grand Prix in Emilia-Romagna. Officials are warning that the rivers could flood again and burst their banks as rain continues. The rainfall has also stretched across the Balkans. Flooding, landslides and evacuations were reported in Croatia, Bosnia and Slovenia. Meanwhile, the UN is out with its latest report on climate change. The UN Weather Agency warns that there is a 66% chance that the world will temporarily hit a key warming limit within the next five years. But they think it will likely only be fleeting as a temporary burst of heat from El Nino, which will supercharge human-caused warming from the burning of coal, oil and gas. The World Meteorological Organization is predicting a year that averages 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than the mid-19th century. Now, that's the number set as a global guardrail in atmospheric warming under the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. According to a new report, a prominent UK landmark is crumbling. A Commons committee in the UK is warning that the Parliament building is at risk of damage or destruction. Its report concludes that there is a real and rising risk that a catastrophic event will destroy the UNESCO World Heritage Building before long-delayed restoration work is done. Some MPs have been reluctant to approve a restoration plan for the Palace of Westminster over the multi-billion pound price tag. A vote is expected later this year. Major political developments have taken place in South America. 
Ecuadorian President, President Guillermo Lasso has put an end to impeachment proceedings against him. Now, he did this by dissolving the opposition-led National Assembly, which had accused him of embezzlement. The right-wing president has denied any wrongdoing. He can govern for up to six months by decree under the South American country's constitution. The National Electoral Council now has seven days to call presidential and legislative elections, which must be held within 90 days. All right, well, another leader says he isn't stepping down either, only this time it's a business leader. Billionaire Elon Musk told Tesla's annual shareholders meeting that he is not stepping down as CEO. And he says that the company's full self-driving software is getting close to where it's safer than human driving. Mr. Musk cautioned that the next 12 months could be challenging for the automaker. This is mostly because rising interest rates have increased the cost of buying a car. All right, well, meanwhile, paparazzi very nearly had a disastrous royal run-in last night. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan's office says the couple was involved in a car chase in New York City, which resulted in multiple near collisions. A spokesperson says Harry, Meghan, and her mother were followed by six photographers' vehicles for more than two hours. Now, this was after leaving a charity event last night. A statement says there were several near collisions involving other drivers, pedestrians, and two NYPD officers. The state calls the incident, quote, near catastrophic. Well, three days after losing his record to a fellow Sherpa, one of the world's greatest mountain guides has regained his title for the most climbs of Mount Everest. Kami Rita of Nepal reached the summit for the 27th time earlier today. He is one of the season's first wave of climbers to reach the top. Mr. Rita first scaled Everest in 1994, and he has been making the trip nearly every year since then. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for more news on demand, you can always visit our website or follow us on social media. Take care, Canada. We'll see you next time on Forum Daily News.